Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody, on Facebook Live. Let's all stand together and uh, enter into a time of worship and praise to our Savior and uh, just sing about who we are in Christ and, and who we are in the Lord. Amen. Amen.
the new year. Uh, we've had a lot of challenges last year. Probably we'll have some challenges this coming year. You all kind of imagine that. So uh, let's, uh, let's just pray. Let's ask the Lord to, just like this song said, uh, give us a peace and a confidence inside as we go into this next year. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name right now. Thank you, Lord, that you are always with us, that your grace flows into us and through us every day that we get up out of bed. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, and because of that, we can look at this new year, regardless of what things look like, regardless of the challenges that may lie ahead, regardless of the disappointments and things that don't go the way we would like for them to go. We know that you are leading us. You are guiding us, and we confess right now ahead of time it's well with our soul. We're going to look to you and trust in you this year. Lord, I pray for a great year, though. I pray for victories. I pray for a growth. I pray for people coming to know Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that this will be an exciting year to be alive in Jesus Christ, knowing that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good to see you. Give the Lord a praise offering again. Good to see you. Turn around and wave at somebody. You know, we're not supposed to shake hands or hug, so uh, just turn around and tell everybody you're good. Glad to see him. Welcome. We'll and, dismiss uh, the, God. the uh, elementary kids as well can go back to their class. The last song they played was too much for my pain. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> there, yes, there will be hiccups in the new year, right? <laughs> it happens. We're so glad to see everyone here this morning and so thankful we have a place to have church, so thankful that God is so good and he's called us together to be a church family and we just love you guys and we're just very, very thankful for everything God is doing in you and in this place. So we just want to mention a few things. First of all, if you're an uh, a guest with us this morning. That's your first time at Summit Springs Church. We just want to welcome you and thank you so much for your visit. And we have information about the church and the Welcome Center out there and a gift for you as you're leaving today. And if you could leave us your information so we can connect and just know who's here, that would be great. We appreciate that. Also, uh, to let everyone know that uh, all the guys know that the, the new men's study starts here at the, at the church tomorrow night at 6.30, doing the, uh, a study with the Chosen um, devotion. I'm not sure what you call it. It's a book. It's a series. It's a movie. It's everything. It's all things. <laughs> so guys are invited to come up for that meeting in this room. You, may, you guys meet in here, I guess. Okay, great. And uh, I, I just also wanted to remind everyone that if you're not receiving our email newsletter, um, we haven't been doing a, a bulletin since COVID, and so we just kind of rely on our email newsletter to let everybody know updates of what everything's going on. Like, we're going to be starting a new women's Bible study here sometime soon. We have special events and weather possible cancellations. We hope not on Sunday, but that, that uh, email newsletter is just important for us to keep connected. So if you're not receiving that, be sure and uh, fill out a family info sheet and that's how we know that you would want to receive that. Otherwise, we try not to put a lot of stuff in your inbox that you don't want. So if you want it, we'll be glad to send it to you. Just uh, great to have a Sunday in the Lord. And we have something else to do here. <laughs> just a minor thing, just minor. All right. <laughs> Once again, good morning. Happy New Year. Hope you guys had a nice Christmas. Hope you got what you wanted. Hope you got what you wanted and didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> oh, somebody else, you know. So anyway, uh, 
looking forward to our stimulus check so we can pay off our Christmas bill, right? <laughs> Not really. Not really. But uh, anyway. Well, uh, once again, it's uh, great to have all of you. I'm going to be sharing a little bit this morning uh, just about the idea of church. And then I'm going to take the last part of my teaching time and talk about what's happened with us as a church body the last uh, the last year, last, uh, you know, 2020, I started to say 19, and uh, just kind of share some of the things that you may not be aware of, but that uh, I think are a real blessing and a real encouragement to us as a local body. But let's start with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we turn to your word this morning, we pray, God, that you'd cause your scripture to come alive to us as we read it and share it together. And Lord, we know it's uh, your word and not the words of men. And it uh, is what really feeds us and brings revelation and understanding to us about you, your kingdom, and your purposes for our lives. So Lord, today, I just pray that you'll uh, enhance this message with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, turning first to Matthew 16, 18. I'm just going to be there just briefly. Uh, it's a common scripture that uh, anytime we're talking about the church, it's a scripture that we read. And now, just let me remind you and connect you. I've been teaching the last several weeks intermittently around the Christmas theme messages about the idea of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. That's been the basis of what I've been talking about the last, really the last month or so, uh, really prior to Christmas. I talked about three things. If you really want to seek God, now, now there's a lot of things in Scripture and a lot of things preachers say that we kind of challenge people to do this or to do that. And for the average person, it's like, okay, how do I do that? I mean, it sounds good, but what does that mean? And when you tell somebody like Matthew 6, is Jesus telling us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, how do we do that? What does that mean? Well, that's what I've been talking about the last uh, several weeks in and around the Christmas season. And that is, there's, I believe, and this is how I base my life, and that's how I can speak from personal experience as well as what I think the Scripture teaches. There's three things that are fundamental in being able to seek God on an ongoing basis. And I've shared two of those already. I'm going to start sharing the third one today. The first one is the Word of God. Without the Word of God, we have no basis for knowing God. If you were on a desert island and you didn't have a Bible and you'd never heard of God or Jesus Christ or anything about religion, uh, you would have a certain understanding if you were open just by looking at the beauty of creation. You might be on a crummy island that didn't have a lot of beauty. <laughs> but even if you looked at the sky at night, you could, you, you'd have to say, in some way you'd have to say, that's amazing. And... <clears throat> It's interesting that all that's up there, and I wonder if there's an organized creator somewhere that put that up there. And so, you know, even, and then the Bible tells us this. The book of Romans tells us that even if a person's never heard the gospel, just looking at creation ought to give them the initial aspects of understanding that there's got to be a God somewhere. Now, it's the Scripture, though, that gives us the specifics about, okay, tells us about this God. It tells us about His nature. It tells us about how He created the universe. It tells us why He created us and what our purpose is. Uh, it tells us that even after we had fallen into sin, He reached out to us through the Old Testament covenants, preparing our hearts all the way up through human history for the ultimate coming of Jesus Christ, his son, who would bring salvation and fully reveal to us the kingdom of God. And so, but it's the word of God that tells us all that. And then you look at the prophetic side of scripture that yet is to be fulfilled, many of which are yet to be fulfilled. Talking about the coming kingdom, the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, God's kingdom fully coming to earth with Jesus sitting on the throne uh, during the millennial reign. All of that is, is stuff that we, we know 
because Scripture teaches us that. So without Scripture, we would be very limited to our understanding on uh, who is God, what's God up to, does God have a plan, does God have a plan for me, does God have a plan for us as a group. All of that is revealed to us in Scripture, and that's why Scripture is so important. And I tell people, you know, I got, I really got born again, not only by guys testifying to me about Jesus Christ and my need for salvation, but primarily through reading the Scripture. And that's been a huge part of my life. So anybody that's in my realm of influence that has an interest in biblical things or Christianity, I tell them, you need to read the Bible. You need to just develop a habit, a lifestyle, a lifelong habit of reading the Bible studying the Bible, digging out the truths of the Bible. Because uh, the first time you go through it, it looks like, wow, I, I only got, I only caught 10% of that. But the 10% you catch will change your life, believe me, because I only caught probably less than 10% the first time I read it. And so that's what we have to understand. The basis, the very starting place of seeking God is His Word. And there's a variety of ways you can do that. Obviously, you should not let any of them take the place of actual Bible reading. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can enhance that with. The second thing that I talked about is relationship with the Holy Spirit. How important it is as Christians to connect not just with the Word of God, but with the living presence of God in us through the Holy Spirit. Because it's when you're born again, it's the Holy Spirit that comes into your life and fulfills Jesus' promise of never leaving you or forsaking you. Jesus went away. He's coming back, but he went away. And that's why he told his disciples, it's imperative that I go away. If I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the vital, life-giving part of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that interprets and tutors us in the Word of God. As we learn the Word, we interact with the Holy Spirit. The, inter the interaction of the Holy Spirit brings greater and greater revelation. And together with the Word and the Spirit, we grow in Christ. So I talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit for two or three weeks. The third thing that I'm going to deal with just as an introductory fashion today is the local church. Because God did not create us to be alone. You see that in every aspect of human relationships. The Bible says it's not good for man to be alone in reference to having a wife and a family. It's not good for people to be alone and isolated in culture. And it's not good for Christians to be alone trying to walk out their faith and understand what God's doing in their life without a family of believers around them. One of the greatest things that happened to me when I became a Christian was, because I was in the military, I had a close, very close group of men around me those first few months in order to help disciple me, help expand me, help me understand, okay, this is what the Bible teaches us. This is how you actually walk it out and put it to practice in your life. I, I, I grew tremendously by watching brothers that were more mature in the Lord than me apply the biblical truths that I was reading. It was awesome. And, and it was important. It was extremely important, particularly in those early days of my life. And, and it's important in our life now. And so the local church provides for us a place and a family relationships to be able to do that. Now, the church is not a building, although it's a blessing for churches to have a building to use as a tool, kind of a home base. That's what... That's what that's why when we were out at the farm, for those of you that are new here may not know that we actually rented a wedding venue facility for three plus years uh, out south of Blue Springs. And, you know, it was nice, sort of. I mean, it was nice. It was pretty. <laughs> it had heat. And uh, that was nice. But uh, it was kind of far out and the people from town didn't really always know where to find us and it was had limitations 
and God allowed us to eventually get this building. I'll talk more about that later. But see, the church, this, this is not the church. I know we got a sign on the front of the building that says Summit Springs Church, but the building's not the church. You understand that? We all understand that. We're not into fancy. We're not into uh, big, expensive buildings for the sake of buildings. Uh, the only reason I ever want a building is because you can heat it and you can cool it. And when it's raining, you don't get wet. Okay? And we can have it throughout the week to have Bible studies, prayer meetings, uh, youth meetings, all kinds of activities. And so that's what the church is. It's nothing but a tool. The building is nothing but a tool. The church is actually <clears throat> you and I. Now, there's two aspects to the church. Actually, there's three aspects to the church. There's the global church, which is Christians all over the world that are truly in relationship with Jesus Christ. Those that have been born again and have truly come into relationship with Jesus Christ in salvation are a part of the church. That's the global church. Now, we're connected in many ways through missions, through uh, various other things with the global church. And then there's the local church. The local church is the group of people that meet in a local area. Now, we happen to be in relationship with several local churches in the East Jackson County, actually the whole metro area. Uh, we have uh, connections through our pastors association with a lot of different churches. So we're not even isolated as a local church, but yet we are a local church. And so that's, that's another aspect. The third aspect is the total church made up not only of local churches, the global Christian population that's on the earth at any one time, but also the brothers and sisters who are already in heaven. Isn't that cool? And you can see that in the book of Hebrews, where the book of Hebrews tells us that the church of the general assembly of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, and that is all of the saints from all times. If you had godly parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that have already died and gone to be with the Lord, they're still a part of the church. They're just not here on earth with us anymore. And it could be that they're a part of that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about, where it's like they're, in a sense, cheering us on that are still here fighting the battle on earth because they don't have to fight the battle anymore, but they're cheering us on to continue walking in faith. So that, that's, that's really the church. Now, now, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he says, talking to Peter, and he's really referring to Peter's confession. In the verse prior to that, Peter gave this awesome confession, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, I say to you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell, or Hades, which another term for hell, will not overpower it, not will be able to withstand it. Now, that, that verse is important. There's a lot of different theological perspectives on that verse. Of course, the Catholics believe that he was talking to Peter specifically and that Peter was the first head of the church and then the popes are still transcended down from Peter and, and the church is built upon the head. We don't believe that. We believe it's built on the confession, the truth of the confession, the revelation. You can't have a church, a true church, that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That's the, that's the foundation. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He's the place that everything, the individual Christian life and the church is built on. So, my take on Matthew 6, 18 is that Jesus is talking to Peter and saying, that's right, Peter, the confession that you gave is right. And upon this rock, the rock of revelation of who I am, I will build my church. So to me, that's, that's very clearly what he's saying. Now turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's, let's look at just a little bit here about uh, what, what Peter uh, reveals to us about the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 4, he talks about coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in his sight or in the sight of God. You also as living stones, plural, are being built together as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood 
to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now let's stop there for a minute. So when you see that, you see some interesting things. It talks about living stones. It talks about you and I as individual building blocks of this church that Jesus Christ is building. So always keep this in mind. It's Jesus who's building his church, not us. I don't care how gifted we are. You know, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor most of my adult life. Uh, you know, I, I've actually planted and oversaw the development of several churches over the years, but I'm not building the church. The true church is being built by Jesus Christ, amen? And so whatever I can do and however I can be used and however you can be used in your individual giftings and strengths causes you to fulfill what Peter said here by being a living stone. Now, if you were a dead stone, you'd just be laying around and you wouldn't do anything, Right? like stones we see on construction sites. They're not alive anymore. But we are living stones, able to be used in a building, but we're not dead stones that can't do anything or can't m change or, or, or grow. We're, we're actual living stones, and that's what's important. So Jesus is building his church. Now, the word church comes from most of you know this. You've heard teaching on church before. It comes from a Greek word, ekklesia, is probably the best way I can pronounce it. And it means called out ones. It's an assembly or company of believers, a company of Christians. So the church is more than one person. You by yourself aren't the church. And I have some different opinions on what actually makes a legitimate New Testament church, but I won't go into that right now. But it's, it's, a, it's an assembly. It's not just you and your family at home in the living room. Now, that, that's a cell group, but that's not necessarily a church by itself. But it's an assembly or a company of Christians. Uh, the whole body of Christians gathered together in a local church, and that would be a regional deal. A company of Christians gathered for worship, sharing, and teaching, uh, being a spiritual house, a spiritual dwelling place together. So uh, that's, that's just some of what uh, the definition of ecclesia means. But primarily it means called out. And we'll look at that more here in just a minute when we get down to Second Peter or First Peter chapter 2 a little bit further down. And so we're living stones. It's important. We are choice. In other words, God has chosen us, and we are valuable in His sight. Notice what it says. It says, uh, you as living stones are being built together uh, as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. So there's several things revealed in these passages of Scripture. It says to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So we're a spiritual house. We're God's family. We're not our own family. Own families are great. It's great to have a family. But we come together as multiple individuals and multiple families, and we make up a new spiritual family that's called a local church. I'll just be honest with you, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, most of you know that. Uh, I've never been really all that close to my blood family. Um, I've got one brother, we get together a couple times a year maybe, and uh, we get along fine, we don't hate each other, but we just don't have a, a deep relationship. We never did. Uh, he's five years older than me. When we were growing up, I would torment him enough to where he'd come after me and beat me up. And uh, that, <laughs> so I was the little brother who was just kind of a nuisance, you know. But, uh, and you know, I came out of a home, a lot of you have heard me say this, where it, it was a German background home. Everything was kind of rigid. Uh, we never talked about loving each other. Nobody ever told me they loved me. Uh, except my grandmother. She told me that one time. Shocked the heck out of me. Because <laughs> I'd never heard that before, you know. But yet I knew people loved me. I, I had a good home. I can't complain. I, don't, I never complain about my home. It was just a non-emotional, non-expressive type of environment. You did what you were supposed to do. You got dinner. 
and you know that was basically it you know so uh but we we didn't have a lot of hugging and loving and kissing and affection and stuff like that in fact it took me a while to get used to that you know and, and so I, I i didn't grow up with that so but but I, i'm saying all that to say this my church family starting in the navy with my cluster of really close brothers in the lord became actually became way more important in my life than my natural family because of the deep interaction that I had with brothers and sisters in Christ. It's amazing. And so that became and has always, always been the main familial and relational setting in my life. It, to this very day, it still is. I would much rather spend time with you all, and I hope my family members aren't watching the video. <laughs> I don't think they are. But I would much rather, I would much rather spend time with you all than I would with my own family. Not, not, now, not my kids and grandkids, because they were raised under me and her. She's, she's very touchy-feely and emotional. <laughs> so... She's the balance in my life, you know, and she's the relational one. And so our kids grew up in a very relational home, very huggy, uh, you know, always telling them we love them. I just, I wanted to change that in my generation. So we did that. We did that. You know, I made sure we did that. And so, but, but my kids, I love spending time with my kids and grandkids and all that. Uh, don't take me wrong. But in, in my other family, my greater family, of cousins and all those people, I would much rather be with you guys because I'm, I'm a lot closer to you all than I am to them. And so, but that's, that's, it's supposed to be that way. It really is. If you read the scripture, Jesus himself said, and particularly when persecution breaks out, uh, those of your own household, meaning your blood family, may be the ones that actually betray you and turn you into the authorities. That, that's what Jesus said. And so uh, he said, your enemies may end up being the ones of your own household. And, and we knew that was the case with Jesus early on. His own family members wanted to have him committed. They thought he'd gone off the, the rails, you know. And at one point in the Gospels, they actually came after Jesus with the intention of taking him home because they thought he had lost his mind because <laughs> he was out there preaching about the kingdom of God and healing people and claiming that he was the son of God. I mean, it just freaked his family out. Now, later, his family got saved. Just We know that. We see that in the history of the early New Testament church. But not to get off on that. And so it's, it's important that we realize that we are a spiritual house. We're, we're considered by God a holy priesthood. And that's primarily in our reference to the world out there. We, we don't need priests ourselves because we have a direct connection with God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But for those who don't know Jesus Christ, we are a link, a go-between, between, between necessarily between them and God. Like I said, God used a couple guys in the Navy to, to share the gospel with me and lead me to the Lord, and I needed that, definitely. And, and they were that link between me and God for that point in my life. And so you guys are a link, a potential link, in your life as a believer, if you're truly a believer, for many people that are in your greater circle, co-workers, neighbors, people that you run into here, there, and yonder, that, that may see something or hear something in you that triggers them to know, well, what, what do you, what, what's different about you? What is it that causes you to maybe talk different or act different? Or you've mentioned something about the Lord or something about church. See, that's a way you link that's the way you serve as a priest to the people out there. And so that's what we're talking about. We're a, we're a holy priesthood, a, a group of priests uh, called together. And it says that we're called in verse 9. Let's go on down and read verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Isn't that cool? Man, man if, if you ever wonder if you have any worth or that you have any value, just read that one verse. Look at that. It says you're a chosen race. In other words, you individually as a living stone are a part of a bigger group of people. It doesn't matter what your earthly racial heritage is, whether you're 
black, whether you're white, whether you're Asian, it, it doesn't matter because in Christ, we become a new race of people. Isn't that amazing? You know, all the racial tension in our world right now, a lot of that is just nothing but stirred up by the devil. He is trying to stir it up to divide people, to get people to hate each other, to ultimately destroy the stability of this planet so he can step in with his godless antichrist kingdom. That's exactly what he's up to. It's exactly what he's up to in our government right now. Exactly. And we need to understand that it doesn't matter what color our skin is. We are a part of a new race. And that race is the blood-bought race of Jesus Christ. We're children of the kingdom of God. Notice what he says. He says, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a new nation of people, a people for God's own possession. God owns us because of Jesus Christ. And then he says, because of that, you will proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise God. There's the definition of ecclesia right there. Called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that amazing? If you, want a, if you want a simple biblical definition of the church, the church universal, the church local, that's it right there. We're called out. That's what ecclesia means, called out. Called out of the sea, the mass of humanity on this earth as a unique people because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's awesome. And it looks what it says. It says we, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out. In other words, we're called out for a reason. I became a Christian. Maybe you did too because somebody in your life lived a different life, had a different foundation, you may not have understood their foundation, but they had a different lifestyle, had a different language. They had different activities in their life that caused them to be unique and catch your attention. And that's what caused me to be interested in Jesus Christ. I saw people that had a strength, an inner strength and an inner purity that I didn't have. It changed their life and it changed their language changed the way they talk, and it changed the things they did. If you've ever heard about sailors when you're out at sea for 30 days and they all go to port, it's not a pretty sight. But these guys did th different things. <laughs> you know, they got together and they went to church together, and they went to the Christian servicemen's club together. They did things like that, and I thought, that's weird. You know, but it didn't take me long to get sick of going to the bars. So I thought, these guys got something different. I want to check into it. And so, but it's because by their words and their lifestyle, they were proclaiming a more excellent way of living. And see, that's what we're called to. That's why, and, and, and you know, I'm not talking about legalism. I could stand up here and tell you, you shouldn't be going to bars. You shouldn't be doing all this stuff. But I don't want to tell you that. If you don't know that because of the internal presence of the Lord and the fact that you are a new person in Christ and you have a more excellent way because of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, it's not going to do me any good to tell you because then I'll just put you under this bondage of, oh, I hope the pastor doesn't see us. I don't care if I see you or not. It's what you live out of your life because of Jesus Christ. That's what makes a difference in this world. If we're all doing the same thing, nobody's going to know anybody's called out. It's just that simple. And so the excellencies of him who called us, him who uh, went to the cross and died and shared his very nature with us through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, is what causes us to be a unique people. And so we're a chosen race, not because only of what we do, but because we have a new life now. We're a royal priesthood, a true priesthood, and we're a holy nation. See, it's a parallel of what God wanted Israel to do, but Israel couldn't make the connection with God. They got into legalism and tried to keep the law and just got harder and harder and harder 
But in Christ, we don't have to keep the law. We walk in the Spirit. It's like I talked about last week. And so this is, this is a powerful passage of Scripture, and it's really the basis of what it means to be a church. And it says we are called out of darkness into His light. And he says, you were once not a people. I tell you what, I know that more than anybody, maybe, that I was not once a people of God. Because I know what the first 20 years of my life were like, and they were not pretty. And so, you know, he tells me that here, and I'm, I'm the first one to say, amen. There was a time when I was not a person of God. He says, but now you are the people of God. There was a time when you had not received mercy. It wasn't because it wasn't available to me. I just hadn't received it because I didn't know about it. Nobody ever shared the gospel with me, and I, I didn't know it was there. And so, but now you have received mercy. And so, see, that's what it means to be uh, a born-again believer. That's what it means to be a part of God's church. Now, let me just take a minute here in closing just to share a few things with you. I want to give you a quick recap of what God has done through you all in the last year. Uh, we were able to give $16,750 this year to missions. And that's just the grace of God. I'm not sharing these things to brag. I'm sharing these things to let you know as a family we can do these things. I couldn't give $16,000 myself to missions. But together as a family we did. We gave almost $8,000 to family assistance. That's families in need, families who were laid off, people who needed house payments, utility payments, uh, all kinds of things happened during family assistance. Let me share just a few more of the things that happened during family assistance. We shared with a memorial fund of a couple people who the father had passed away suddenly and we, and we had little kids. We shared uh, with those families. We did a backpack outreach last August when school was starting. We gave away 20, I think 22 or 23 Thanksgiving boxes full dinners with turkeys and all the fixings. Uh, we've obviously helped single moms assistance in several different ways. And, and so all of that together came to about $8,000. Um, another thing that God really did that was unique this year, we, we moved, as you know, from the farm to this building. Now, this building was just a raw building. Uh, it had been a gym, but it was just didn't have any of these walls. We raised... You raised, you gave a total of $75,500 $75, to this building project in addition to what God had already let us accumulate the years we were out at the farm. And so that was a real blessing because we were able to do the total interior carpet, all the furniture, the, a new sound system, lights, cameras. That, was, that came later, but that was a part of that figure. All of that totally debt-free. The church has no debt, no debt whatsoever. And uh, all we have to do is uh, pay our annual lease payment, which is pretty hefty. But, uh, but at least we don't have any debt on the interior of the building. But see, you guys responded and you paid for all of that while we were doing it. So that was a, that was a real blessing. And individually, uh, this is the point I want to make. Individually, I don't think any of us, maybe some of you could have, but we wouldn't expect that. Individually, none of us would have, would have come up with over, well over $100,000 in one year to give to ministry activities. But together, we did. Amen? Amen. Together, we did. And plus, there was a lot of you that ho donated tons of hours in uh, coming up here and helping wire and paint and and that's a monetary value that we we don't even know what that would be but that's probably at least another 20 grand that went into this in this project with labor actual donated labor and we thank you guys for that and the neat thing about it that i want to say is is that that's one of the aspects just one it's not the main but that's one of the aspects of the value of a local church is that we can do things together that we wouldn't be able to do alone. We need each other. I need you. You need me, I hope, at least once in a while. We need 
the relationships, we need the resources, we need the giftings. You all are gifted individually. You guys have talents that I don't have. And because of that, we need each other. We need people to help us do things that we're not very good at, okay? And so if you're new here and we haven't figured out what you're good at yet, <laughs> don't be bashful. Please tell us if you've got some unique skill or some or just something you really like to do, and you want to share that with the body of Christ in any way, whether it's administrative, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, teaching, speaking, whether it's uh, music. We, we need more people in our worship team. Uh, sound booth, if you've got an interest in uh, cameras and sound booth, we need more people to help be trained or learn back there. If any of you really are high-tech people that already know how to run that stuff, don't hide from us anymore because we, we are desperate. We had two weeks in a row where our, our broadcast went down because of some little old electrical box back there, a little connection box that went out, and it took us two weeks to figure out it was that. So our, our Christmas Eve service went out, and our la last Sunday service was kind of fouled up just because of this little worthless box. And I don't even know what it is. And, uh, but that's what it was, right? That's right, Noah? That's what it was? All right, yeah. All right, we won't hold you responsible this time for that. <laughs> All right? So help us. I mean, we love, we love interacting together, okay? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for what you are doing. You are building your church. And uh, we thank you for that, Lord. And uh, we just give you praise. We ask that you all minister through, in and through all the folks that gather here together every week, that we can give you glory, that we can further your kingdom, and that we can see more people come to know Jesus Christ because of your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to close in worship and we'll dismiss you in just a minute.
I'm going to be up here if any of you want personal prayer. I want to talk to somebody about anything that uh, is going on. If you need prayer, we'd be glad to pray with you. Also, the ushers are going to be at the door. Last week we mentioned that we we're going to be taking a volunteer uh, love offering just around the holidays here to give a little blessing to some of our key volunteers. So uh, if you want to give to that, they're at the door for that purpose so today. Otherwise, go in his name. Have a great week. Good to see you today. And good to see all of you on Facebook Live this morning as well. I hope the broadcast was uh, better. I think it was. All right. Amen. God bless you.